Okay, we're live. Welcome, everyone. Okay. Um, hello. Hello. <laughs> so, um, mm -hmm. my name is Erica Ruby. I am the managing editor of Leonardo. I would like to introduce to you our special guest today, Pino Trogu. He is the author of the featured free download in this month's issue of Leonardo. It is called Giorgio Scarpa's Model of a Sea Urchin Inspires New Instrumentation. And this is the featured free download. Um, you can Download it by clicking the link um, in the comments if you're on Zoom. Um, it's in the Facebook event if you're on Facebook. I encourage you to do that and to check out some of the other articles that are in this issue. So welcome to Pino Trogu. He, uh, as an introduction, he teaches data visualization, drawing, and letterpress at San Francisco State University. He owns an MFA in graphic design from RISD, where he was a Fulbright Scholar. He has a BFA in graphic design from Instituto Superiore Industri Artiste, Arti how, how do we say it? Industria Artistica. <laughs> Artistica in Urbino, Italy, and a diploma in industrial design from... Instituto Statale d'Arte. Thank you, in Sardinia. He's an author, um, most recently, of Counting But Losing Count, The Legacy of Otto Neurath's Isotope Charts, um, the book and the image of the book, Cognition, and the printed page. So welcome, Pino Trogu. Hello, everyone. Thanks for, for having me. Uh, yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Leonardo Journal and uh, Leonardo Editors. Um, and, and I'm really honored to have had the article published and also honored to have had such great uh, peer reviewers uh, read my article and help me a lot with the article. Uh, it, it really shows, I think, uh, if, they're, if they're watching, they, they know that they really uh, helped me a lot. Um, I also would like to thank Oda de Sisti, Scarpa, Scarpa's wife, for um, telling me that I couldn't bring the original model <laughs> to the conference and why don't I make one? And so that was the beginning of the adventure. I'd like to thank also in Italy Lorenzo uh, Bocca and uh, Antonio Cirenza and um, because they helped me make the model and my son Francesco who also helped me make the model and at San Francisco State uh, Sylvan Lin and Richard Ortiz um, and uh, yes so uh, thanks again um, yeah I'm, I'm so, really... so we want to um, just introduce that you made a 3d printed model um, mm -hmm. after Giorgio Scarpa's original paper model that he made of Aristotle's lantern, and that is the mouth of a sea urchin. So can you tell us right. a bit about Scarpa um, and, and how mm -hmm. he came to develop this? Right, right, yeah. So um, as far as I know, it's still the only full-size analogous model of the lantern, even though there are really dozens of articles about sea urchins. And I simply asked him once, I said, how did you come up with this or what made you think? And he, um, he said, uh, well, I mean, he was interested in nature. He, he never even killed a sea urchin, but um, he said that one time at the beach, he picked one up or maybe at, at, at the rocks of the tide pool. And he told me that the urchin opened up. And, and, and so he was inspired. He was inspired by that movement. And when he told me, I thought, oh, okay, he must have seen this whole thing opening up. But I've since seen that he could not have seen that much because there's a lot of things. So he must have seen just a little bit, but it was enough to, um, to inspire him. So he was, he was really just interested in how nature worked. And uh, um, so, but that's, that's literally how it started. He just, you know, started looking at it and, um, you know, tried to figure it out. So what is, what is Scarpa's background? Is he a scientist? Is he an artist? Yeah, he's, he started out as an artist uh, and ceramist. So he painted in his uh, early 20s. Um, but then very young, about maybe 22, let's see, maybe 24, he went to Sardinia to teach um, what you would call architectural drawing, um, descriptive geometry, or yeah, architectural drawing. And so he actually had to teach himself that, that part. Um, and pretty quick, even though actually he went to uh, apprentice to a, an important painter in Sardinia, pretty quick though he abandoned painting and devoted himself to more bio-inspired design work. Um, and, uh, and just 
topology research too. So shapes that change configurations, not necessarily changing their structure. Um, so yeah, you would, I guess you would call it a polymath or a renaissance man. And I mean, if you look at the model, you could almost imagine that, you know, Leonardo might have made that model because it's such a great machine. So uh, what, what was the time period for this? You said he went to Sardinia. Yeah, so he went to Sardinia, I believe, in 1962. Yeah, so he would have been 24. And he probably built the model late 60s, early 70s. So when I uh, went to school at the Instituto where he taught, um, that would have been 70-something. Um, it was already built, so I saw it already, you know, finished. Um, and the first time I saw it, I was like, whoa, what is this? You know, it, it really was <laughs> pretty striking. Um, and so you met him there at, at the yeah, university? Yeah, so I had him as a teacher. I didn't have him every single year out of the five years uh, that I went to high school. Um, but I had him in um, for, again, what was called architectural drawing or um, technical drawing. Um, and then... Um, yeah, I actually told his sister once that I wasn't sure why he let me in. I mean, I, I was interested, of course, and I was actually pretty good at drawing, um, but he was very shy and very, um, not really, um, he didn't want to show off ever, <laughs> whatever he did. So he, he let me in by also letting me do a, a few drawings for his books. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was, uh, that was really nice. And, uh, and I remember telling him one day in his car, I said, I'll never be able to do what you're doing, you know, and he said, well, you're just too young now, and, you know, of course you will, but, but I was really, you know, I could see that it was, you know, genius. And so you, you have translated his books, sorry. Yeah, so it's a rough translation, but they're available for download, so, um, and there's no copyright issues, um, because, yeah, just because of the editor, with the publisher, there's no issues, and they're online at the same website, and maybe later we can you know, point to that. Um, so people, people who are interested can download it. Yeah, it's, uh, it was all done by hand, literally on a typewriter, uh -huh. step, and then Xeroxing and binding it. Um, but it's pretty good. I mean, you know, if you, just to get the basics. And that's actually what the uh, uh, Frank, uh, Mike Frank from San Diego, from um, University of California, San Diego, um, called me, said, uh, do you have any English translation? I said, yeah, you know, pick it up and, and a year and a half later, you know, he did his dissertation on that. So that was, that was interesting. Yeah. So um, tell me more about the, um, the paper model that he made and then your uh, reinvention right. of it. Yeah, so, so the paper model, uh, so when I said to Scarpa's wife, I said, I'd like to bring it to this conference, you know, I got to accept a little paper and I want to show it. And she said, no, no, you can't bring it because it's in bad shape. Uh, what? And I was like, oh, no, what do I do? And, you know, that's how it started. I said, oh, maybe I can make it. Well, it turns out the model itself is still perfect in terms of the paper construction. It's super clean because you don't see any of the connections. Um, and he just drew it. I mean, he just drew all the parts, figured out what the sizes were, you know, probably just using a, a hand lens to see the parts, you know, the original parts. Um, and then the intricate of how all the elastics go together, that's, that's quite impressive. And I, I, would, I would love to go back in time and see how he did it. Um, but, uh, and it's very light, so it's very beautiful. It's, it's super light. Uh, the elastics are a little bit worn out because now it's about 50 years old, but the model itself is really perfect. And it's not a copy. I mean, it's, it's very analogous, but of course you can do these very complex rounded shapes. You have to use triangles, squares, rectangles. So it has its own beauty in that it looks, um, it looks it's a new thing. And, and, and so he was very much about, well, what am I going to do if I just copy it, right? So... So you have some media to show of, of the original model. Yeah, so let's see, maybe, um, let's show the drawings about that. Sure. We'll just show maybe some of his original drawings. Okay, so I'm gonna share, let's see. And uh, let's see if we find the uh, very first set, which are the drawings that I, um, that I actually used 
to uh, construct my 3D model, uh, which was done in a, in a modeling uh, SketchUp. I just use SketchUp, I, I, I don't really know any fancier uh, program. Um, so these are all in pencil, they're a little light, and some of them are simply images, uh, projections, orthographic projections of the models, but, um, but some of them are the construction drawings that he did in order to figure out what these shapes were. You know, imagine that you have to build a box, you know, you pretty much know that's, you know, a cross perhaps, and then you build your box. In this case, there were, the parts were really pretty elaborate. This is the, uh, this is the upper part of the jaw. So this, what you see here is, is a, a developed or a flat, flattened out ver, uh, version of all the triangular parts and other parts that make up then you know, the enclosure. Um, so you can imagine that, you know, this is quite a process if you don't have a computer. Uh, but, you know, of course, Leonardo and architects in the Renaissance built, built cathedrals, right, without a computer. So it's not, you know, it's not impossible, obviously. Um, so these are just different views. And some of these are simply illustrations for the book. Um, uh, this particular drawing was very, very useful. It's a kind of a slight, uh, various slices of the um, uh, triangular pieces, the jaws. So I, all these points were really, really useful. The jaws themselves actually don't touch uh, perfectly on the sides. And this is what these shapes represent. There is actually a little gap between them. Um, Let's see if I can, oh, I guess I would have to go back to my screen. I'll show it later. Um, well, I guess I could show it here. Yeah. So I don't know if you can see the gap between, between the various, um, the various jaws. Um, anyway, these are super useful. And uh, I made myself a little paper model before I uh, moved on to actually construct it. These are also just construction drawings. Um, this is the drawing of a, it's called a rotula, it's a hinge. And uh, you know, for everything you have to do something like this where you have to come up with the exact shape. Um, let's see. I mean, some of them are just beautiful in their own right. You know, if you look at something like that, it's, it's just quite nice. <laughs> Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, so from these drawings, basically I made, you know, I replicated one of the jaws, which was the bigger part, um, and then the other parts kind of came together. At that time, though, I did not actually uh, know how the parts went together in terms of all the elastics. So we literally, let's see if I, yeah. So we printed the parts and, um, oops. Um, so we printed the parts and the, it was pretty hard because we didn't have big printers and, and so we had to use whatever and, and so we had to glue a lot of the pieces. <laughs> um, so this is actually at San Francisco State, we are, you know, just printing all the pieces, kind of rushing against time because I had to leave for the conference, which was, by the way, in Milan at the, um, it was called the bio, uh, biomimetic and biohybrid systems. And it happened to be at the Museum of Science, which is, you know, named after Leonardo. And, um, and so I literally traveled with these parts. I think I got there a week and a half before, uh, before the thing was to be shown. And this is the day before it. In fact, it's not quite finished yet. <laughs> um, so these are just some, yeah. Uh, at this point, I think we had pretty much figured out how they went. Oops, we had to take little breaks. <laughs> um, and on the left here, it's us. This is going back a little bit. This is the original. Uh, figuring out what those patterns were with the elastics. Because the whole system is uh, quite balanced when you move it. Um, and so, yeah, literally we have to go and see. Okay, let's open it up uh, and see. Well, I have actually, I have a question yes. from Facebook asking yes. how many iterations of the drawings did it take um, to make the, the final paper model? Do you know? 
uh, his, his original or my? Do, do you the mean? original, yeah. The original, well, I think the drawings you saw are possibly it, uh, meaning that whenever he solved some problem, he probably just went on and made it. You know, he didn't, he didn't spend time like, oh, this is so big and this is, you know, because he didn't need to. I mean, he, he, you know, it was just for him. So I believe it was just one set, but I do have, um, yeah, it's a, it's a good point. The drawings themselves, those are pretty f the final, but there were, um, let's see if I can get it. There were some earlier models, some more schematic models. Mm -hmm. So let's see if I can show that. Um, and I recently re, uh, rediscovered them. Okay, let me, um, well, let me just let me just see if I can uh, go straight to that. This part is interesting too. It's his beginnings as a painter, uh, but let's just see. Okay, just give me a second. Um, yes, here we go. Okay. Okay, so this is just the, this by the way is the cover of the book, which actually shows how the plates on the test, which is the shell, connect. It turns out the shell is made up of flat parts. It's another interesting little thing. Uh, and this is him showing the model at a school in Faenza, Italy. Um, Uh, this, by the way, shows pretty well how the lantern fits inside the, the, the urchin and you only see the tip down below here. Um, these are just some macro photographs. This is a drawing by, by him. Um, these are big the parts were, so you can imagine that, of course you could not copy them. I mean, unless you had had a scanner, you know, 50 years ago to do then a 3D print of the scan. Uh, yeah, this shows an early model. And it's actually um, just simply paper. These are just strings, they're not elastic. So he was just testing how it would balance. And this diagram, I would love to know from an engineering standpoint, if it is actually, well, it must be because the model does work very well. Um, I should I say a coherent diagram of all the forces because he, you know, he then went on and did it. So this is actually is an early version. You can see how schematic it is, you know, which is also beautiful, right? Because it's almost, it's almost like completely abstract. So this is the jaw, the tooth uh, slides inside. Well, it doesn't really slide, but grows inside. And this is the base of the urchin. Um, and this is an early also model of the system that he had to create in order to make the urchin, the mouth open because in his model, he's missing one important muscle, which is called the protractor muscle, which would push the jaws down and make them open. Well, with an elastic, if you try to pull something, nothing happens. The elastic just gets longer. So he created this umbrella uh, device that you can see here again in the, in the detail of the original. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is, <laughs> these are some of the paths that I had to basically figure out each jaw is, has a double eight connection. There is more elastics, which pretty much um, parallel, you know, the real urchin. Uh, this is a, uh, the real model, actually. Uh, you can see all the elastics are hidden, you know, all the connections are hidden inside the parts. You'll see in mine, they're not quite as clean. Um, yeah, so let's see, should I? stop the sharing for now yeah we have another question uh, here coming through facebook um okay. it says, thank you for the discussion love the model model in the article um in the article you mentioned that scarpa was interested in studying plants and seeds and the question is why do you think that is oh yeah well he, he um well i think i quote him in the in the article as saying that if i was gonna do bionic studies the those, he said, basically, don't forget seed, seeds because, in a way, they're very, very important. And in his um, view, but I mean, we know some of the self dispersal mechanisms that they employ 
um, are just unbelievable because in many cases they have to overcome crazy constraints. And um, so, yeah, so when I was in Dell, for example, there were a lot of studies, lectures too on seeds and how they explode and they and the forces that they, you know, produce relative to their size is like just crazy, crazy, crazy strong. Um, and he has some models. Unfortunately, I don't have any to show, but I know that he has some models that, you know, flatten, open up. Um, and they're just, uh, yeah, I think he, he just, it, you know, he, he was always, he just thought there was, a, I guess, a, you know, sort of at the beginning of life, maybe, um, you know, very, very, because they're so humble, right? Um, I, uh, I actually did, I don't know if we would have time to see, but, and if I could find it, but I did, um, yeah, I, I played with a, a seed from a loquat, which is this fruit, the tropical fruit that is shaped like a football. And it turns out that if you let it drop, it will bounce up and up and up straight. Just like, you know, imagine you're watching football and the football all of a sudden starts bouncing like a soccer ball. You know, it doesn't make any sense. But so that was an interesting, um, an interesting thing. Uh, yeah. And, and, he, and you saw the picture in the, I mean, the photograph of his workshop desk with all the seeds. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a photograph in a similar photograph of Paul Clay's um, collection of seeds in one of his books. Um, he was very, very, very much inspired by Paul Clay. Um, so this and, is the, uh, the image you're discussing with things. Right, right. So there is a very similar photo in, in, uh, in uh, one of Clay's books about, uh, you know, from his, because he studied nature. He was, he was very much, uh, you know, he studied really. And the quote that he has, um, which is about the interior of things, and he uses the word content, you know, form versus content. Well, he's talking about a cube, but it's really more general about how the interior the content is, is this whole territory that's like you have to explore. And Scarpa always said it's very hard because we have to look at it from the outside, whereas, you know, a seed grows from the inside. And so it's like we want to be inside, you know, almost like honey of shrink the kid kind of thing where, you know, you're like inside seeing it, but we can't, right? So it's a... Uh, it's so it seems he had he had great interest in the inside. Yeah, he, but he was very humble. I mean, you know, he, he said, "Okay, I cannot be inside. So you know, what can I do? You know, how can I, you know, still do something that tries to capture what's inside without? I mean, of course, today, fifty years later, he probably would have been able to get closer sure. to the inside because of uh, you know because of the tools we have today. But but this is you know this is mid sixties, so. Yeah, so uh, you have some media um, of the sea urchin itself and its jaws, what would have been visible to Scarpa when he picked it up. Right. What that looks so like. let's see. Yeah, uh, I think we'll just play the file first that is also on the supplemental files. So if, if people are downloading the article and they go to the abstracts page, they can look at the supplemental files. So one video shows a great, um, a great, okay, let's see, uh, video of a real sea urchin. Um, and believe it or not, it was filmed at an airport by a, a, a Japanese professor who just loved it and just was able to capture it right there and then. Um, in parallel, so the, this video shows in parallel with um, the uh, ground sampler that the uh, people from San Diego, from University of California, San Diego made. So, so maybe you uh, can um, introduce that and, and talk uh, a little bit about that, about that. So the article is how the um, model inspires new instrumentation. So we're talking about um, new developments in technology that are have analogous um, structures to this this lantern right so um let me just open it and maybe pause it for a moment yeah okay so yeah so actually this is from uh, uh michael frank and other people in a team at, at san diego university of california in san diego they made a uh, what they call a mini rover for um ground sampling on mars the idea being that if you send out a little rover it's going to be very fast, come back to the mother rover and, you know, with the sample. And so this is interesting because I found out about the other biopsy device through 
through Michael Frank. And at the time, he was not doing sea urchins. And then a year and a half later, actually, he focused on that and, and came up with this model, which is actually very analogous to both the sea urchin and the um, and Scarpa's model. So I'll just play the video. So on the left, yeah. So this thing is about a quarter of an inch wide, if you can imagine, on the, le on the left. Um, so these are the teeth. Um, and as they close, they overlap slightly uh, to slice, because if they didn't, it would be harder to cut. Um, and on the right is the uh, scene from underneath, is this, uh, you know, basically the sampler. Uh oh, my cat just jumped on the table. Um, and uh, so this is the mouth of the sea urchin, and uh, this is a tongue-like things, um, and that's the esophagus right there. So, um, and there's other beautiful little things here, which are little pumps. Um, so I have another picture of this. Let me see if, um, uh, actually it's in the slide. Let's see. Um, yeah, here it is. Yeah, and the team in San Diego, of course, you know, they had, you know, uh, electron scanning photography. Um, so this is the, the sampler. Uh, and it's attached to a little rover, like I said, and, and it just, you know, uh, collects soil. We could uh, maybe just see it. Let's see if we can see the video of that. Um, there we go. Yeah, you can see it's pretty much constructed with Legos, as far as I can tell, plus, um, it's about the size of a fist, the actual um, collect, uh, yeah, sampler. It's very analogous to Scarpa's model and this, well, to Scarpa's model in that there is a piston that pushes the jaws open and then the elastic, this elastic pretty much closes it back. Um, yeah. Would you show us your model to so we can see just sure. how, how close they the, look? The real thing behind me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, just a second. Let me um we have to move a few things, so I hope we don't jeopardize anything. Uh, okay, go away. Um that was just a message. So I have to push the camera back. And of course the cat, you don't see her, but my cat is literally sitting on on the book that I put behind the computer. She might, make her, she <laughs> might make her appearance at some point, I don't know. Um, okay, and I'm just gonna drop the camera, so I hope you can still, still hear me. Um, okay, so this is the model. And uh, it's quite heavy because it's, it's uh, yeah, it's 3D printed, even though you can print it fairly light. Um, so from above, um, you can see it's a, yeah, pentagonal symmetry. And uh, you've got five jaws, which, so this, each one of these is a jaw, the tooth is inside. Uh, each jaw has a, uh, uh, each each pair of jaw is hinged by a, a rotula, and there's a, another part called a compass. Um, and so this normally, if these were function like rotational hinges, you know, they would just simply open sideways. But because they're constrained by all the others, the net move. The net effect is that they move forward. Okay. Um, so, and it's quite nice because you can, you know, it's a it can go in any direction. So we're just gonna try to see if we can show it. Um, and what's beautiful about the model is that actually the teeth slide out of the jaws, which is not something that happens in real time in the urchin, because that would be funny, right? If your teeth were moving while you're trying to bite something, that wouldn't be so good. Um, but because the teeth grow over the lifetime of the urchin, mm -hmm. um, my guess is the scarpa 
uh, did that to show, in a way, the life of the urchin over time. It's a, it's a beautiful, I think, um, you know, just change. It's definitely not what happens in the real model, but it, it decided to, to make it do that. Um, so let's see if I can describe the parts, maybe a little, yeah. Um, about, about I put this back and I have another piece that actually shows a little more comfortably what, so let's see if I can. Okay. Um, yeah, so I made a, I have an extra piece. Um, so the main part is the, the jaw, right? And it's actually made of four pieces, two at the top and two at the bottom. And the teeth, um, the tooth is inside. Uh, and like I said, it grows over time. So the path of that, of that channel inside, it's, it's always the same. It's the same idea of a corkscrew where, where it, you know, if you keep going, it just, you follow the same path. Um, and then this part, Let's see if, I, yeah, it's called a rotula and it hinges inside here. And like I said, normally if this were to just go sideways, it wouldn't be able to do much because it's constrained by the others. But because they're all combined, you know, the neck effect is that they, you know, that they push out. Um, yeah, so in terms of just, um, let's see if I have a, yeah, now it's a little, a little hard to show, but um, some of these elastics basically are for the models. There is no real elast there is no real muscle here, um, but uh, there are some elastics that pull the lantern down. Rather, in the real thing, the muscle would pull it down. In the model, that's achieved by that um, uh, umbrella like that you saw earlier, uh, and then the elastics just bring it back. And then all the jaws are connected together by uh, elastics, which are called, um, in the real thing, they're called interpyramidal muscles. And I have a, a good shot that shows that. Um, these are called, uh, let's say this is um, compass depressors and they're, um, they just keep everything balanced. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite elaborate. So basically there's like 40 pieces altogether if you count the five support pieces. And there's a very intricate um, muscle system um, where, you know, it's sort of this, you know, end directional movement that, that the lantern achieves. I actually have a video, maybe later we can show this actual sea urchin. Um, yeah, so. Um, I, have, I have a question um, also on Facebook asking if mm -hmm. you're planning on making another model based on uh, a natural structure. Uh, me personally, you mean yeah. a different animal? Yeah. Uh, not at the moment, um, but, but definitely, yeah, it's, it's quite beautiful. I, I do teach full time. <laughs> so it's, uh, the summer is usually the time for, you know, like extended mm -hmm. projects like that. But um, but I must thank, and, and as we're like sort of on TV now, the people at Delft University of Technology, where I spent a sabbatical a year ago, uh, working on more work that Scarpa did. And so yeah. they, were, they were a great support. So um, I would love to. I, 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 I feel like I still owe to Scarpa that I have to, you know, do something with seeds. <laughs> Maybe the Loquat seed I mentioned earlier um, could be the one that, you know, I tackle, although it's, it's a, uh, Pretty interesting. If we have time, maybe towards the end, we can show that video of the bouncing, bouncing low quad because actually it's not solved yet. It does that, so we'll see. You do have some um, little paper recreations of some of his other work. Yes, so yeah, so like I said, it, it published two books, uh, thanks in part to, um, so this is the first, well actually this is the second one. This was the, uh, the Bionics one. Um, but the first one was this one, and it's, uh, it's geometry, it's called Models of Rotational Geometry. But really, he was, I mean, if, if, if one reads, uh, and in fact, I can read your little um, uh, quote from the book, you can see that he was uh, 
I mean, he was putting his designs next to uh, fiber uh, pictures of muscle fibers, you know, micro photographs of muscles, because he was studying muscles, how they turn and how they shrink, you know, how they, they short and how they work. And um, so the work I'm doing now myself is trying to move forward those, um, those models that sometimes he just did as a design, but could not really replicate. But yeah, I have one one beautiful little thing that actually was done about 20 years ago. And uh, two, three years ago, there was an article published by a group from Harvard and basically uses this shape, which turns out was invented in the 20s, but I doubt that Scarpa was aware of it and also back then whether in fact. Um, so it's again, you know, it's a topological figure in that it doesn't change in its structure, but um, so it's basically a, a cubic shape. It's actually part of one of three, only three regular honeycombs, so-called, or lattices, um, where all the parts are the same throughout, uh, sort of a, 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 in infinity. And this is made by hand, and this is an original, and it's, it's quite amazing after 20 years, it's still very... So yeah, this group from Harvard made a uh, metamaterial so there's a new, there's a new trend now in materials, advanced materials called metamaterials, uh, where things can, you know, shrink to very small volumes or fold up. So from, you know, medical instruments to um, uh, space structures like uh, solar sails, for example. Um, so I could, I could show what this, you know, what they did. But basically, yeah, 20 years later, you know, something that he did, for fun, I suppose. It was a little present. Um, another example uh, that I can show, let's see, is this one. Well, actually, let me show you, this might be interesting for teachers, which is in my class, and this is the connection to school, my students have to do this simple problem, which is they have to split a cube into two parts like this, and they happen to be the same um, if you look at them. And so this was something we used to do in school when I, in the 70s, when I was going to school at, and Scarpa was my teacher, so I still do it with my students. Um, so it took this idea of setting, splitting up a, a cube, like a cell, into different parts and then hinging them. So this particular student that the same sex made three parts. So now all of a sudden we have, you know, these are actually three of these make the cube. And if you take that further, you can actually, um, if you start hinging it, so this was made by a student with our own design. Um, and it's quite interesting. So what, it, what Scarpa did was he made very long chains out of um, so-called platonic solids, for example, and then he hinged all the parts together. Um, another really, this is in the book, by the way, and the, the book, by the way, if anyone is interested, someone could literally follow the instructions to build these models <laughs> with their own designs if, if, they, you know, if they chose. So this is another one in which it's a cube made of three parts, um, but if you take, so that's the cube, but if you take one of the thirds out, then that gap leaves room for one of them to sort of fall into the, the original space. And, uh, and this is one of the uh, designs that's in the book, in fact. So it's again, it's a triangular um, chain, um, which is flat. You can see it, and it's about 12 of those modules, but you can turn it so that it actually becomes a cube. <laughs> so uh, in the book, I've tried to like do some of his designs the way he scaled these to have hundreds, which of course he could not make, so I'm trying not to do that. Of course, it's my, my dream is when somebody, if somebody invents a paper 3D printer, which is really hard to do, <laughs> yeah. so that I can make this by printing them. Um, and then one very, um, so this is, uh-oh, the cat. Um, so this is actually, a, it's called a hikosahedron. So it's 12 uh, triangles. 
and I actually made this. I don't know if Scarpa actually made one, but it's definitely illustrated in the book. Um, so it took each face, which is a triangular face, and split it into six little triangles. And then from there, it went to the center of the, of the solid. And you can, and now I'm just going to lose it. So, oh, wow. so basically, it just becomes one giant. It's, it's hard to show it all, but it's basically 120 pieces. Um, and there is a picture of, of this in the, yeah. We won't try to put it back together <laughs> while we're alive because that might take some time. But um, so a very simple um, system in a way where the hinges are passive. Um, and I don't know if anyone is interested, but in, oh, look at this. Um, at Delft, everyone was saying, oh, but let's, let's make them activate all these hinges. I don't know. To me, the interesting part is that they are passive and they, so they mold themselves into, you know, different shapes. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, you know, if everything is open. Sorry, the cat. <laughs> she's very interested in all the, yeah. well, in all the urchins. <laughs> she's helping. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, oh no, go away. So we, um, we spoke about the uh, Mars rover prototype and right. in the article right. you speak also of a um, biopsy device that also was inspired by this model. Can you talk right. about so, that? Right, so the story, yeah. So the story is that I got a call from the fellow in, in San Diego saying, oh, do you have a, you know, do you have the English book? And I said, yeah. You can download it, but I was curious, how did you find out? So I found out from him that, um, that he's, uh, he's Slovakian actually from Bratislava, but he was, started, he was getting his PhD in Delft, University of Technology. And, and Michael from San Diego said, oh, I saw your website you know, cited in this article about this biopsy device. I said, really? <laughs> You know, I was like, um, you know, I was a little sad because Scarpa had just died, I think, a year before. So just as all these things were coming out, you know, I couldn't like tell him, hey, by the way. Um, so, yeah, this is his dissertation. And this is a group in Delft called the, uh, it's called BITE, um, Bio-Inspired Technology um, something. And they, uh, they work as, uh, especially on minimal invasive uh, instruments. Um, this is a fun cover for his dissertation. It's him trying to get inspired and all of a sudden the sea urchin strikes uh, inspiration and, and it comes up with, you know, using the app. Turns out he was actually already using, um, he was already studying sea urchins, but it was when he saw the video and maybe we can play that before the end of, of Scarpa, which I filmed in 1994, they realized that's exactly the kind of motion. So his, um, his model is actually quite small. I'm going to share again here for a moment. Um, and this is the other file, by the way, in the supplemental. Oops. Okay, so uh, why can I not? Sorry, I'm having a little trouble here moving the. Okay, maybe yeah. So the prototype, it's the main part is this part, which is a. It's about the size. Well, the thickness about a pencil, so five five uh, millimeters, and we are. Uh, the tip is the most important part. You can see it slightly, slightly open. So this is actually the very first prototype that was still ha having some problems. Um, and, uh, and here what happens is that actually the jaws, which is the tips here, start close. So at rest, they're open and they close as they move forward because of the taper in the channel here. So the, the motion is inverted in terms of its sequence, but it's really the same as in the urchin. So in the urchin, it goes out, grabs, comes back here, and, and it's closed rather. So it moves forward opening and moves backwards closing. But here it moves 
forward closing and then it just comes back and it's a it's a cartridge that you would um, then um, you know take the sample out um, let's see um, there is one slide if I can show that shows all the parts so this it told me it took about yeah about a couple of years and um, about it told me about 35,000 euros in terms of all the all the um, you know all the man man hours and all the you know the the, the manufacturing and that's him. Its name is Philip Yelinek. Um, he also de des designed a um, a steerable instrument onto which. Oops, I hit this mouse thing. Sorry. Let's see if I can. Quickly go. Um, so the tip of the instrument would be placed, you know, on top on top of this uh, steering instrument. But let me see if there is a, yeah. So this shows the motion of, of what happens. So there is a tapered, um, there is a taper ending, and so it's a it's a little crown that's forced through that opening, and because of the taper, it's forced to close by a very strong spring. Um, and these are all the parts actually. It's quite, so that's a match right there, as in, you know, to start a fire. And the, the part that's uh, essentially the analog of the, of the sea urchin, it's this part here. It was done uh, using, um, I forget, electric discharge. It's a wire that cuts it. And because of that, it had to be six elements instead of five. Um, and it's a little cylinder. Um, so that that spring will push it through that opening. Um, let's see. Um, there was one little video, maybe not now. Okay, so yeah. Um, trying to see if there was another video of the, but maybe I'll just stop sharing it and show it directly. Um, yeah, so this is the the little, and this is 3D printed, by the way. These things, yeah, could not be machined because they're so small. There's some wires that go through, and with just uh, four wires, which would be connected to a scissor-like handle, um, you're able to either move it in one direction or the other, or open and close the. Um, and this is, by the way, how the state of the art today in terms of biopsy sampling and harvesting is they're like forcep likes, which is not ideal for all kinds of reasons. So Yelinex prototype would be an improvement because it's very precise, very central. Um, let's see if I can just close it. Yeah, there you go. And of course, you know, all these things are not out there, you know, they're just, you know, several years if, if you know, it, it might take a long time to even get them to, to production. But they're, I mean, the connection, it's, it's what's really, really beautiful that I like to call it meta bio inspired design because you don't have to go out to nature. You can take Scarpa's work and use that as sort of the inspiration, you know, because it's already inspiring. Um, so, yeah, so let's see. Um, we have about 10 minutes. We have 10 Maybe. minutes. I'd like to yeah. invite anyone who's watching really to chime in with your questions. We've had some great questions. Mm -hmm. um, but in interim, is there anything that you would like to share? Um, I know you. Um, yeah, let me just, get let me to just yet. see what I have on, on the. Um, well, perhaps I show. I did. I did uh, photograph yesterday some a really great specimen that I that I actually found in Scarpas. Oops, I need to share before I do that. Um, that I found in Scarpas' house in a, in a box actually, and they must have made the trip from Sardinia to the mainland. He he actually moved back to where he came, where he was, where he grew up, which is near Bologna in Italy. Um, and so this particular specimen somehow. Uh, became, in other words, didn't lose all the tissue. Um, the contrast is not so great, but hold on. 
So is that the opening at the top or is that the interior? This is still the, um, the lantern. So this is still right. the, uh, uh, in other words, the, the urchin itself would be here, right? So the teeth, the teeth, are the teeth shown or the teeth underneath? No, the teeth are underneath, yeah. But what, what this shows, which is really nice, and when I was making the replica, I was like, oh, where is, because I studied the, you know, the real thing, a little, the real animal, and I read some articles, and so this was a very important muscle, which is this muscle that's the one that pushes the lantern down. But of course, of course, after I realized, well, he's using elastics, he can't pull something with an elastic. Um, but yeah, yeah, this shows the support structure. These are, and you can kind of see how intricate. So between, for example, these are the muscles between the jaws, you know, kind of bundles going around. Um, and the ones that are not shown are some really thin tendon-like muscles from the, le from the compasses to balance the whole structure. But you can clearly see the tooth inside. Um, let's see if I move. This is the view from underneath, and uh, I hope this urchin did not have a sort of a violent death because, oops, <laughs> sorry, um, because you can see the teeth are overlapping in a, in a funny way here. Um, but yeah, it's beautiful that it, it got preserved. Um, I think the red is just from the, uh, from the tissue that got, um, this again is that that device that, that the tip would be would become and this is another sample so um, it's very important apparently evolutionary in terms of the study well the study of sea urchins in general and this particular the the lantern aristotle lanterns they say it's it's the reason why they've been so successful um, in fact maybe too successful I've been reading that they've, they're eating up all the kelp in the, really? the Southern California. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's been bad. The combination of the warm water and other factors um, because they can, you know, they can, they can bore through rock, they can eat. And I should mention that there is a, uh, a new uh, Netflix series called Our Planet, um, narrated by Attenborough which is fantastic in the, sequ in the segment about the, the water, the coastal waters, there's some amazing footage of, of uh, sea urchins eating. They're quite, quite um, uh, impressive. Cool, I'll look for that. Yeah, um, well, perhaps I'll just pull up the, f the files from the actual, oops, from the actual journal. Let me share again. Um, and then if we have a minute, I could look for that bouncing low quad, even though it's uh, <laughs> nothing to do with the search. And let's see, yeah, we're sharing, okay. Okay, so yeah, for those watching, these are the illustrations from the article itself. Um, this is, is, oops, I have to be careful with my mouse here. Uh, um, so the uh, yeah, this is how it sits in the in the in the urchin, right? The uh, the spikes are here, um, and these are the muscles that are involved. The main muscles are the protractor muscles, which push the lantern down and open it, and then the retractors close it. Um, and this is the original model on the right. Um, so from the outside, you basically just see that. But you can kind of see, and this was out of the water. It wasn't liking it. Uh, so you see the little teeth, and you can kind of see these bumps. That's literally the lantern where the, that membrane on the mm -hmm. bottom. It's called, yeah, it's called something I can't remember now. But it's, you know, it's, it's sort of wrapping now around the, the, the bones and because it's, you know, it's not, yeah, it doesn't want to be in that state. Um, but there is this overlap pattern, which is very important, you know, because if they just met at an angle, it wouldn't cut very well. Right. But because it slices, you know, because they overlap, and so the slicing motion makes the makes it very effective. Like a five point scissors. Yeah, yeah, something like that, right? Um, oh, this might be interesting, actually. So, so that's so that's 
Okay, the reason he couldn't push it with elastics is pretty obvious. So he created that that piston that opens it up. So when you push down, you know, it opens. And um, and this is what I figure out basically that oops too much. So what happens is there is a the these rods open it up and then there is a little thread that is what pulls the pulls the tooth out you know there's a little pulley there it's connected to this other um, spoke and that's what makes it come up um, so this was quite ingenious um, and uh, yeah that's the that's the first replica there these again are from the um, actually that's that's not the actual illustration it's white in the in the in the news in the magazine but um, okay see i'll stop sharing and uh yeah maybe i don't know if there are no uh, minutes, more. Right? we have three more minutes um okay. i'm gonna meanwhile i'm gonna look for the log quad unfortunately if i find it the sound i have my son playing the piano in it but unfortunately if i find it i'm not sure that um yeah sorry do you have any do you have something else um i would i just wanted to thank you for for you know, being open to joining our book club. Again, this is um, our third book club um, live stream event. Uh, we're going to try to do these every month, alternating between articles from the journal and books from the Leonardo book series. If anyone wants to subscribe to the journal or buy a book from the series, we have a discount code for our book club members. That's Leonardo20. You can use that in the MIT Press store as our thank you for joining us on our book club. Um, please just stay tuned. We um, do announce these in our newsletter. There's a link in the Facebook comments on how to subscribe to our newsletter and be alerted when we have our next book club event. Okay. Hey, Erica, I did found the, find the video of the bouncing the seed. So I don't know if uh, we have two more minutes. Yeah. Should we play it or you, yeah. you think, okay. So yeah, if anybody's watching, they can try to find out how this works because I don't know. Um, let me see if it plays. I'll try to share this. And then, and then I'll just say thank you to everyone. Also, thank you, Erica, for having me. It's been great. It's been really supportive. And again, thank you to Leonardo and, and everyone else at Leonardo. So I'll just uh, play this if it plays. If not, you know, bye-bye and, and it's <laughs> really fun. <laughs> so let me see if I can share this last thing. It's really just a few seconds long. Um, and there is, uh, oops, let's see, sorry. Um, there is sound, but it might not play. So just imagine that there is piano, piano music playing. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So I'll just play it. Yeah. So this, uh, is it playing? Yeah. So these are loquat seeds. It's a tropical fruit. They're very slippery. And this is just me dropping that seed um, mm. just from about, you know, regular height. And the way I discovered this was I threw one at my cat. But <laughs> because the cat was right at my feet, I just dropped it. And this, this seed just started to bounce back up, you know, at the same, in the same direction and also higher at time. In other words, after the initial bounces are small, then all of a sudden it jumps even higher. Somebody explained that the energy is the same on every bounce. Um, but it's literally shaped like a football, more or less, a triangular football. So if someone can figure out what's happening, that I think is a great... Um, we'll, we'll we, challenge. We could, we could write a paper on this. Yeah, we'll <laughs> challenge the Leonardo community to look at... Look yeah, at there you that. go. There you go. <laughs> um, the, it's split in two. I looked it up. It's split. If you if you open it, it's made of two parts, like most seeds. And one part is a little bit bigger and kind of fits into the other, kind of like a flywheel, maybe. But um, yeah, fascinating. So anyway, this is my little contribution to Scarpa's uh, suggestion to start yeah. these seeds. So someday maybe we we can we can make something out of this. <laughs> well, we're here at the end of the hour. So I think we'll, we'll wrap up now. Okay. All right. Thank you again.
Thank you so much. We really um, appreciate your being here. Yeah, yeah, it was really great. And um, again, thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.